I've got it. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Kirby. I'm with the Hercules Democratic Club, and I'm uh, going to record this meeting. So I want to make sure that our <clears throat> committee members and our candidates are okay with that. So if you just kind of raise a hand, if you're okay with recordings, make sure everybody. Uh, thank you. Great. Okay, so. Um, we have a committee, five people. We have uh, Roland Esquivius, we have Dion Bailey, Trisha Murphy, and Anton Younger and myself, who are interviewing our candidates, Estella DePaz and Jamila Folds. We're going to go around and ask some questions and give them uh, two to three minutes to answer. Figure that these are short answer questions. Tomorrow we will do an in-depth interview with uh, Jamila and Estella. So when we start, I'll start with Roland, he'll ask one question, then we'll go to Dion, then we'll go to Tricia, Anton, and myself. Uh, candidates, when it gets to be about a little over two minutes, I will do a little happy face. Can you see that? That's all I'm gonna, and all I'm gonna do is hold it up for a moment and, and down, and we don't have to say anything, and you just kind of figure it out, and uh, we're not worried about uh, too much formalities and stuff. All right, committee members, anything before we start? Yes, Steve, um, who should go first? Should um, Jamila go first or Stella go first? Good question. Uh, you could choose and then we'll alternate. So whoever you choose first, the second question that <coughs> Dion will ask his first question, he can, the other person, so we can alternate. How does that sound? Okay. Are they, are they all going to get an opportunity to answer all the questions? Whatever we ask, they'll each answer the question. Okay at the time. Okay. Steve, can I make a recommendation? Yes. Uh, why don't you choose uh, the order that the folks answer the question because everyone's pictures appears in different orders on our screens. So if I'm looking, for example, next to me on my screen is Jamila, but it may not be that way for everyone else. So the second person for everyone may not be the second person. So why don't you call out the, what I would Correct. recommend is you call out the person to answer the question. I think you've established it's Roland in this case. And then you also select the candidate that's going to answer the questions first. Um, and maybe they just know to rotate from that point forward. So if, if Jamila were second in this hypothetical, she would get my question and then um, and so on. But I think you need to call out who you want because it'll get right. a little confusing if you don't. Well, yeah, when I said first and second, I meant alternating. So, okay, very good. So, so first I would like to go to Estella <clears throat> and then Jamila. Estella, I'd like you to say good morning and give us a minute or two of you and then we'll go to Jamila and then we'll go to Roland for our question. So good morning, Estella. Unmute. You need to unmute. Um, She's saying she needs me to do it for her. I'm working on it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and work on Jamila <laughs> okay. too. Um, good Excellent. morning, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Estella DePaz, and I'm running to be the District 1 trustee for West Contra Costa Unified School District. You got my guys are probably asking why you're running Estella. Well, so the story really goes back to 1981. This is when my family immigrated to the United States from the Philippines. My parents absolutely believed that my brothers and I would be getting the best education in America. As a student, I was able to take advantage of that because I was an English as a second language student. So in that ESL class, I learned how to become proficient in my English. And I also found a place where I have a safe haven so that I can get over the culture shock and work through any kind of teenage angst that I might be going through at that time. As a parent, my son was actually diagnosed uh, when he was in preschool. So West Contra Costa, which with, it, with its phenomenal special education programs, really helped my son. And I fully believe that because of that, his life's trajectory has changed. Our public education system is going through an enormous amount of change and challenges. So I am here because I had an aha moment where I saw that these changes are going to create a lot of challenges for us. I believe that we need to be focusing on four things, which are my priorities. We need to manage the district budget. We need to support our students in their social emotional learning and mental health. We need to help our teachers in distance learning, which is really the way we need to go right now. And we need to continue to engage and strengthen our community the way we're doing right now, sharing information and having dialogue. My background really is in business. I have been um, a project manager since 2007. I hold a PMP, which is the Project Management Professional Certification with PMI. I have 20 plus years of 
management experience in product development, in um, testing and quality assurance, and in project management. For the last almost 15 years at this point, actually, I have been a very active vol volunteer in the school district. I've held numerous um, leadership positions as a community leader and formerly as school site council chair for about five different schools throughout the district. Also very active in district level advisory committees. And that is what I bring to the table. So I'm hoping that today we can continue the dialogue I have an opportunity to get to know you better, better and earn your trust. And I respectfully ask for your vote in November. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estella. Welcome. And Jamila, welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jamila smith Folds. I was born and raised in Alabama. I'm a teacher. I'm a parent. I'm a community leader. I'm a staunch advocate for students and for teachers and for parents. I have been a resident of Hercules for over a decade. I have um, lent my life to service. That's what I do, it's my passion, it's my position in the world, I serve. I have been a service to the school district, not only as a teacher, but also as a parent volunteer. I've served on school committees, SSC, PTO, PTA, a APAC, ASAT, so there's, nothing that I haven't done except for this position. And the reason why I want this position is because it's the decision making table. The house is on fire. And I've been on the outside screaming, the house is on fire. I've been in the room as a teacher screaming, the house is on fire. Now I want to be at the decision making table and be able to slap someone's hand and say, stop playing with matches. So I want to do preventative work now. So the reason that I'm running for school board is because it's time to take that shot. You have to forgive me. I have a house full of Hamilton lovers. So it, uh, some of the reference are going to be Hamilton based, but it's, it's the truth and it's the feeling. And it's my, it's the time. It's my time. It's the time for ward one. This is the first time we will be able to be represented on the school board as a ward, Hercules Pinole in that part of Richmond. And it's, we need to bring the voice. I have the voice of the community because you can find yourself in me. I have three students. I have a gate student, I have a student with special needs that goes through the special ed program, and my youngest student, she will be called into the principal's office. I will have to navigate that so I'm able to be that person. I can bring that voice, your voice, all of our voices to the board, and the voice not only of parents, but of the community also. So that's why I'm running, and thank you so much, and I really appreciate the opportunity and the trust and the time to take your voice to the board. I'm there for the community and I'm there for our parents and our teachers and our students. Thank you so much, Shamila. And thank you both for your introductions. And <clears throat> I want to go to Roland. I'll start with uh, Stella and Jamila next, and then we'll alternate after that. So Roland, if you'd like to ask your first question, we'll begin. Thank you, Steve. Okay, the first question is, what have you done for the past five years that makes you a strong candidate? for this position. So Stella has to be unmuted again. Yeah. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, for the last five years, I actually have had the opportunity first uh, to become even much more engaged in our community, um, starting with becoming the uh, president of PEACH, which is the Parents for the Educational Advancement Community of Hercules. PEACH is actually a grassroots organization. And currently, we're working on getting our 501c3. So, you know, <laughs> more, 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 more energy on our side. The second thing that I've been doing is active participation in a lot of things with um, the school site council. The Maker Fair, which is actually in our fourth year, was something that I co-created with our librarians, Ms. Perkins, who's retired, and Ms. Anthony, who's unfortunately leaving our district because she had a better offer. But we expect to continue those work. Um, the, the, the other things that I've been doing actually is I've actually just finished my master's in project management. Um, that's because I had the opportunity to leave my company about three and a half years ago, and I dedicated my time to educating myself because I'm really trying to figure out what is going to be next for me. I'm in a position where I can make that kind of um, career change, and I've decided that I will want to do the best I can for education. I've tried actually being in the classroom. I found that very rewarding, but being a project manager, it was important for me 
to actually see progress. And I have to be honest that my timing <clears throat> or uh, results that I'm putting in place is shorter than five years or the maybe after they've grown up and become adults in their life and they have aha moments. So I wanted to be able to make sure that my background really in management and in organizational leadership, which is, which is really very policy based and my technology experience can, that could actually, I believe right now help with all the changes that we're seeing with you more use of technology in the classroom. All of those things are what I bring to the table and all of those things are the things that I've been working on in the last five years. Um, furthermore, I am very passionate about our young people. I'm actually the Interact Advisor for the Rotary Club. And one of the projects that we're working on right now is the development of the Rotary website because I pulled together a project-based curriculum for some of our in interactors over the, over the summer. And that was really a um, uh, pretty deliberate type of steps because what I saw was with COVID-19 that happened in March, I can see the social emotional challenges that our young people are facing. I saw that they lost community. They're <clears throat> not in the classroom anymore. They're not seeing their friends who used to be in English or history that they feel are peers. We needed to create a space for them to actually come together again not in that academic fashion, but more as a way to actually discover each other once again. Is it ideal? It's not. But it Thank is you. definitely a way for us to move things forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stella and Jamila. So in the last five years, I, if you go back five years, I had a fifth grader, I had a seven-year-old, and I would have had a three-year-old at the time. So what I've been doing for the last five years is investing in their education and investing in their education on multiple levels. I've also taught in the last five years. I've been in the classroom. <clears throat> I was the leadership teacher and activity director for Hercules High School. I was the coordinator, the Hercules High School coordinator of EOS, which is Equal Opportunity Schools that brings equity into our advanced placement classes and beyond because we're dealing with COVID-19. It brings equity all over the uh, school with all populations. I have been a, uh, I, actually peach with the seller is president of that came out of the last five years in the parking lot when i was talking with other parents in the parking lot and we developed peach so um that's the cbo's the community-based organizations i've been highly invested in those and they've all come out of necessity peach was a necessity so founding peach was an honor i was part of the maker club committee we do bringing makers to hercules in the past five years we had one we tried to have more, but things happened and with COVID-19, we couldn't do that. So being on that committee, being a uh, parent volunteer with ASL in our middle school, uh, the American Sign Language, being the room mom for the class of 2023, doing those things, the boots on the ground work inside and outside our school, being part of the climate team, being part of the SSC, which is the school site council. I'm sorry, all these uh, acronyms kind of sound like alphabet soup, so I'll try to make sure that I explain what they are being part of the parent-teacher organization, taking the parent-teacher association in the middle school and turning it into a parent-teacher organization, being part of HEF, which is the Hercules Education Foundation, a board member of HEF, being part of the APAC, the African American Parent Advisory Council at the middle school and the high school in the last five years, being invested not only in the middle school where my daughter would have been going into in the fifth grade, but being part of the high school when she wasn't even there. So I had many people tell me, what grade is your daughter in in high school? And I was like, well, she's not in high school. And they were like, well, you're always here. You always have to be where they are, where, where they were, where they are, and where they're going. So that's what investment looks like. I don't just follow my child. I stay where she was. I stay where she is. And I go to where she's going because that's what, to me, parent investment looks like. And I want to be that voice. I've, in the last five years, I stood in the gap for parents who couldn't be there who had no choice but to go to work, had no choice but to be somewhere else for their kids. So I was there for their children. And that's what I've done the last five years and what I want to continue to do in the next five. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mila. I would like to go to Dion and uh, he'll ask his questions and I will, uh, I think I'd like to start with Jamila. Yes, because I started with the cellar before. Thank you very much, Jamila, you're on again. All right, good morning uh, to all the candidates and to uh, the 39 or so folks that are listening in. 
this morning. Uh, my question uh, is uh, the West Contra Costa County School District, the uh, school district board recently decided to remove SROs or to remove funding for SROs specifically from, from their campuses. Um, do you agree with this decision to remove SROs and then why or why not? Thank you so much, Dion. Um, the thing that I, the, what I believe the district needs to do is not take a paintbrush to the entire district. We are a huge district. We serve almost 30,000 students in this district and we cover five cities and un unincorporated cities. What works for one area may not work for another area. So there has to be community conversation. You need to make sure that you go inside the community and ask what, how will this impact them? What does this look like? And then if you take something away, you have to be able to implement and put something in place. So the SROs at Hercules, and the SROs in Pinole have very different relationships with the students and the community and the teachers and the staff than they do at other parts of the district. But be clear, if harm comes to one student, it affects all students. So we have to be able to understand the impact that a policing society has on children in campuses. So what I would prefer and what I will choose to do is bring everybody to the table before you make a decision. School psychologists need to be brought to the table. The school counselors need to be brought to the table. School community leaders need to be brought to the table. And the students need to be brought to the table. And don't forget the teachers and the staff. Have a conversation about what it is the, what is the intention of the SROs at the school. And if we remove them, how do we keep what the good they brought to it? How do we eliminate the bad and how do we keep the good? Because they had a function. But again, community conversation. We have to be able to talk to those that it impacts the most with the understanding that if one child is harmed, it's an unacceptable policy and we need to replace it with better. Always replace with more and with better. As it pertains to Hercules specifically, let's get those cameras up in the middle school. Get those cameras working and up and imp implemented in the middle school so we'll be able to have eyes on our students because they're still babies and we have an open campus, so we have to have security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamila. Estella? Oh, Dion, thank you so much for the question. And I have to be honest and say that I don't agree with the decision. Um, this is something that our community, community in District 1, both Hercules and Pinole, um, a number of our uh, community members and actually elected leaders have gone in front of the board about two and a half years ago to say, please do not to spend or stop the SRO program. Um, I have to also say that I've have got a very strong relationship with our SROs here in Hercules. Um, in fact, they are community members, just like what Jamila is saying. Um, I was gonna say a name, but I won't. Um, our uh, SRO members are um, coaches for our baseball team. Um, when we had um, our um, grade level meetings um, last year, I advocated for and have been advocating actually even before that, that every time we're talking to the kids and the SROs are talking to the kids, that they provide the dispatch number so that our students would actually have that available with them wherever they are. In fact, a story for you. Um, last um, last year around Christmas time, one of the girls came up to me and says, Mr. Paz, when I was coming to school, somebody was following me. And my question to her was, did you call the number? I know you've got it because you were at the, you were at the meeting and I know that the officers gave the number. Did you have it? And she says, no, you need to do that. Our SROs are a different relationship than the other parts of the district. Just like what Janine was saying, we are a big district. Therefore, really the policy and the decision to make that, um, to defund the SRO, was picking winners and losers. The district and our board needs to learn how to make a decision at the right level. So there should really be a policy and programs. Because if they're at the program level, we know inevitably that somebody would actually get the short end of the stick. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stella. I'd like to go to uh, Tricia and uh, I, I see that you're on mute. I want to make sure you have come on mute. Is that better? Great. And, and then, uh, okay, so Tricia, and I'd like to start with Estella. So I'm going back and forth. So please ask your question. Sure. Estella, good morning. 
Um, I'm curious to know what you see as the board's roles and responsibilities. As so, the um, board. thank you, Tricia. So, um, um, thank you for that question. So, first and foremost, and actually, I did some research on this. Um, according to the California School Boards Association, the CSBA, really the board is supposed to do five things. And a lot of them are around setting direction, providing structures for how the business of the school is going to be done, and how to provide leadership in, in, in the organization so that making sure that we are ensuring that our students are educated in the best way possible. But I also believe that the board needs to define a very clear vision and a very specific set of outcomes so that our students are actually getting the educational services, which is their right. I believe that mm -hmm. the board is also responsible for creating the framework associated with processes and programs to actually help provide some direction to our um, administrators so that those goals that we agreed to have can actually um, efficiently be implemented at a local level. One of the things that I've been talking to a lot of administrators about, which is a philosophy of mine, is this idea of globalized policy, but localized implementation. The only way we can actually make sure that the, um, the, the, the vision and the goals of a, a big organization like West Contra Costa Unified School District is correct for a community is by actually allowing our very talented local administrators to do what they need to do for their community. That model is also something that I, when I'm learning through this whole process, it's actually what they call a community school model. And what a community school does, it allows for those things that would help make sure that our community is getting the voice and the um, services that they need. So besides that, what I'm trying to say too is that our board needs to make sure that the community is always heard. Thank you for the question, Tricia. Thank you, Estella. Jamila? Hi, thank you for the question, Ms. Tricia. Um, I do want to just step back for a moment. The story that Estella told was so powerful. The thing that the young lady also had, she didn't have the number or the SRO, but she also had the number of a teacher. She called me and we talked about it and we discuss what happens after. That's a part of helping with the trauma is having the students have someone to call. So the fact that she had, she didn't have that number, but she had a number and she could then be directed where to go is a powerful thing that we need to keep inside our community, in our school community. As for the board, the board is a governing body, but the best way to think about the board and forgive me, I'm a teacher, but the best way to think about the board is their grandparents. They're the grandparents. They set the culture of the family. And so as, as the grandparents, they set the tone, they set the pace, they set the understanding. When your grandmother comes into the house, your kitchen is not yours anymore. It belongs to her. She sets the rules. She knows she's the person that people go to. If mama says no, grandmama gonna say yes. So it's one of those things that the board at the head of this is the way that sets the tone. They govern. They also take care of the budget, the hiring, the firing. They have the understanding, the understanding of the community, but they're managers. But they have to do it in such a way that it's a trusting relationship. They have to have trusting managers in place because they deal with our children directly and indirectly through every policy that they make. Policy guides practice. So you have to have a, a firm, equitable, sustainable, and capacity building policy to then set the tone because it ends up touching the children. So you want to have a strong governing body. You want to have a strong, committed grandparent organization that can then help you set the tone for the kids because those are the ones that are really going to reap the reward or have the harm to what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. I'd like to go to Anton and I will start back with Jamila because I'm alternating. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate the candidates participating in this uh, forum this morning. My question is, how do you think the new 
Measure R bond construction program should be implemented? Thank you so much. I think that what we have to do before implementing anything, and, and remember COVID-19 has put everything on, kind of like on a pause. So I think we have to go back and we have to really look at the time that's allocated to us and make very strong, positive decisions that are forward thinking. So when we go to implementing bonds and measures and we need to make sure that they all fit inside the parameter and the boundaries that we are now living in. It's not so much a new norm, it's our norm. This is what we have to do now. So how do we take the time that's allotted to us when children are not on campus and they are on through the virtual, through the virtual screen, screen, how do we take those times to look at our schools and their construction, to look at the um, roadmap, the 2020 roadmap that was presented? How do we look and make sure that we are using funds and using our time that's given to us in the most productive way? And that means that you have to bring everyone to the table and you have to bring everyone to the table with an understanding of what can we do better now? How do we make it better now? How do we work with the time that we're given now? So it's thinking in the present and moving in the present, but also having the idea of this, what's this gonna look like? What's the re-entry plan? What does it look like when we get back to what we all knew to be accurate or to be our, our place? Thank you so much. Thank you. Estella? Um, so um, Proposition R, with, uh, I'm sorry, Measure R, which actually passed in, in March, is a $575 million um, bond program. And um, as you guys know, bonds essentially is a contract. The language in the bond uh, measure is actually a contract between the agency, in this case, West Contra Costa, and the community. So that is something that holds us in place about how we can use that money. What happens with a bond, as you guys all probably know, is that it's really associated with capital investments, which means buildings. So in our district, we have a, um, a master plan, which has been put together by the district employees with the board, and of course, with our um, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, so um, actually the first time I was um, in front of the CBOC was probably around um, 2012 in the proposal to actually rebuild Wilson. And at that time, I got to understand much better what the CBOC does. So what I understand right now that needs to happen is that facilities master plan, which you guys can all find on our district website, is going through a revision to look specifically at what Measure R has promised our community. And Measure R is actually looking at seismic retrofitting and what you would call um, priority needs. So these are critical needs projects, which means things like um, in Richmond High School, for example, it's a very old building. They have issues with HVAC, so ventilating the whole, um, the whole school and making sure that we've got fresh air for the kids. Um, also in Richmond High School, when that was built in the 60s, there was a lot of civil unrest. Therefore, at that time, they decided to actually close the windows because it's safer. That really needs to be reopened. So those are the things that we can do with the bond because that's what we promised. So at this point, I would like for you guys to really engage in what's happening with the facilities master plan um, rev rev revision. It was actually presented about two board meetings ago, and I think there's more conversation happening behind that. It would be a great thing to get involved in because we've got a good process for the CBOC. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask a question and I'll start with Estella, if I may. Uh, would you please talk about what you see are the impacts of parental choice in our school district, charter schools, private schools, religious schools, parental choice, Estella. Thank you for the question, Steve. So um, I'm actually on the record for saying that I have a very nuanced view about um, specialty charters. So spec charters and this idea of choice because what I've seen is when we have uh, very engaged families, very um, you know, motivated community to actually create a different choice because they feel like their students are not getting the support that they need um, from the school district, 
or they might have a more innovative way of actually, you know, educating the students that they are very dedicated to and they understand that taking on something like that would take maybe about four or five years to actually develop. I don't think I can stand in the way of something like that. And we have some great examples in our area. For example, the Oakland School for the Arts, which is a charter school that is actually a theme school, which is what a charter is supposed to do. The origination of the idea of a charter is to come up with kind of like a, an R&D space, if you will, for different and innovative types of education that would be available to the community. Granted, that's, that's not exactly how charter is being implemented right now. We have a lot of issues around what the CTA, the California Teachers Association has called CMOs, which is Charter Management Offices, which basically brings in charters from different locations into your locale. My, my, I believe that we need to make sure that the decisions around charter is set at a local level. If we are going to have a charter because it's based on what the community needs are. So that's what I have as a value as far as choice is concerned. And I also saw very recently, in fact, that CTA said that they are actually now okay with the idea of a charter because of the original thinking around creating a laboratory space, an R&D space for new ways of finding educational programs, but they're against the CMO model, which I think is consistent with the point of view that I've been putting out there. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to go back to, oh, no, I'm sorry, going to Jamila. Thank you. So I'm a public school teacher. I, all my children go to public school and there's, as a parent, there's something that I hold sacred. I'm not arrogant enough to tell anybody what to do with their children, but I am open enough to understand that there's best practices out there. I, public funds should go for public, the public funds for public school kids, but they're, they're here. Charters are here. So how do we be good neighbors? So how do we, how do we work collaboratively with each other to serve the whole? The way that I think about charter schools is it's divorced parents, but you have to raise the children together. So what does that look like? How do you co-parent? You may be divorced, you may be on two different sides, you may have all of that, but you have a zone of mediation. You do have a care for children. So what's the best practices that I can take from your organization and put into public schools? And how can I use that to bring the school children that are in the community back to the public schools, back to their home schools? But charters are here. So how do we become good neighbors? How do we make sure that everything's transparent? How do we make sure that everything is equitable? It has, there has to be a level of equity in all things that we do for children. The policies and the practices have to be guided. It has to make a, we have to have an understanding that children at every level deserve the best. Children at every point in their education deserve to have what's coming to them. And it goes to the it goes to the money spending with the bond measures. It goes with the allocation of the money that goes to charter schools in this district. It also goes to what happens inside those schools. And it happens what ha happens inside our public schools. How do we make sure that children are always at the center? The student is at the center. And if a parent chooses to send their child somewhere, ask the question, why? Service is about asking, how can I help you? And at the greatest level, the board needs to be a server. How can I help you? What can I do to help you bring your child back to this area, back to our schools, back to the public schools? What do you need? How can I serve you? That's the key to leadership. That's the key to being a board trustee because it's in the word trustee. I need you to trust me to make sure that your voice is being heard, but also to solve your problem. If there's a problem, I can solve it. And you do the research and you have the sustainability and the capability and the community to, to create that, to solve those problems that parents are having. Parents have real problems and they need real solutions to them. And that takes a lot of service-minded work and it is work. And I'm ready to work. I've been working and I'm ready to work at this different level. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamila. I'd like to go back. Oh, that was the end of our first round of questions. We're going to go around again. I'm going to go back to Roland. I think it's going very well. Thank you so much for having it all work out. Roland, Thank and now we'll go to Jamila again. because. 
Okay, so um, the question is, what can you contribute in the district's learning continuity plan, especially with the current COVID-19 crisis? So what I contribute is my prior knowledge, my current knowledge as a teacher, not only a public school teacher, I'm a registered homeschool teacher. So this is my wheelhouse because we're all homeschool teachers now. We all are in this exact same boat and we need to be rowing the exact same way. So that builds relationships. I love to think about a relationship is we're all in a boat and how are we relating to each other to get to the other side. So I'm a resource and this my whole life has been built up to this point. The point to be able to take a parent and look at them and say, breathe, you can do this. Let me show you how to build that relationship with the teacher. Let me show you the skill set that you need. Transferable skills. That's what I have, Roland. I have transferable skills that I can now look at a parent and say, don't worry, I got you. I understand that it's overwhelming. I understand that it's taxing. I understand that you are going to have to step outside and take a break because teaching is not easy. And teaching your own children is even harder. But how do you build those relationships and stay connected with the school via Zoom or Google Meet or all the other aspects that keep us away from touching each other? It's a big deal. And it's hard to teach a parent how to teach a child how to read because they don't remember learning how to do it themselves. They just remember that they did it and they know it. So it's scaffolding. It's taking it step by step with grace and patience and knowing that it's going to be okay. Your child, your baby will be okay. Let me show you how. It's guided steps. And I'm able to do it, not just because I have a degree in it, but because I have measured practice in it at both in the public school as a teacher and sitting at home with my own daughter who I've homeschooled from second grade to fifth grade. And I'm homeschooling the baby now who is going into second grade. So I have the skills to do that, Roland. Thank you for that question. Thank you very much, Estella. Um, the learning continuity plan is actually a state requirement. It's something that they have requested or actually required that we complete. And actually it's a very fast moving plan that require we address very specific issues because of COVID-19 and the decision by the governor to actually stop any kind of going back to school. So it has um, issues as associated with like addressing learning loss, making sure that we've got provisions for how we manage the social emotional learning and mental health issues that we are already expecting will probably be exacerbated with our young ones. We're also trying to make sure that it also is trying to make sure that we address parent and family, parent, family and student disengagement because we've seen that when we're doing Zoom and we're doing distance learning, a lot of our students just walk away. So there are nutrition um, elements that also need to be addressed. There's something like about seven different areas that the community needs to actually provide input for that is required by the 9th of September. That needs to be drafted with vetted information from all of our communities. And then we are required by the end of September to provide that to the county so that we actually continue to get the support from the state that we really, really need for this coming next two years. So during the um, board meeting um, last Wednesday, I made a request and actually I'm hoping that um, to really advocate it more is to make sure that District 1, Hercules and Pomo have got a strong voice in the creation of that plan. Because what I've seen, and I'm a DLCAP member, is that when there's a requirement from the state or the county, it tends to go to existing systems of feedback and often than not our district is not represented in that forum so i want to make sure our voice is part of that for this particular and very important learning continuity plan thank you for the question roland thank you so much i'd like to go to dion and then uh, back to estella for first dion yeah so my question goes back towards sros so um, in light of the black lives movement matter there's been some um, movement as we just discussed about sros coming out of schools so there's some other reasons for that as well but would you please share what alternatives you believe are available to replace sros on campus so what's the alternative Bella, so thank, you. thank you for that question dion because actually in the middle of june when we were having a conversation at the board meeting about sros I made, um, uh, again, another plea 
um, to the board that being addressing the role and the responsibility that our SRO had played for us needed to be a, a part of the return to school safety plan that is being drafted at that time by the task force. And I believe actually they're listening to that or that particular um, item is already on their, on, on their radar because they're addressing it. Right now, I know that part of the conversation that are happening with staff is actually how we go about identifying the training that's required for our CSOs. How do we actually create that formalized roles and responsibility definition so that we stay safe and that we actually have trained um, adults in school who would then have to help and can help our students who are making bad decisions or under distress. So that part of the conversation, as I think is already happening beyond, which is the good thing. Um, I believe that because, again, a lot of those CSOs are local, we can transition into that world. It is a different, um, it is a different role and an additional role for them. I also hope that continuing the partnerships with our cities and our police officers, um, both here and in Penol, for instance, that we already have a strong relationship with, would actually allow us to make it so that if we ever have to have a situation where we're calling police into our campus, they already know our campus. That we create that conversation and we create that partnership, although the relationship right now is apart. Thanks for the question, Dion. Thank you, Stella. Jamila. So the key to having a strong safe school is having a school that has community involved. So when we're, we need to bring in community-based organization, there's Healthy Richmond, there's Kingmakers, there's Peacemakers, there's the Culture Club, and we need to create that safe space starting from the students, creating a safe space among themselves. There's affinity groups, there's the, I know my classroom was the room that people came to for safety when they had a problem, when they needed a space to just step away and breathe. So they did not have to react. Pain is a reaction. It's, it's, a, it's a feeling that they're expressing. So having a community and having a, a body for kids to go to and having people on campus that can say, hey, are you okay? What's going on? Let's take a walk. Let's take a, a let's get some air. Let's have a space. Let's go to the let's go to the career or the health center. Let's go over and talk to the counselor. Let's go over and reach out to this treat teacher, which is your trusted adult that you put down on your form as somebody who can help take you from where you are to where you want to be. So it's implementing those things, and now it's doing it through COVID nineteen. It's doing it through Zoom. It's still building those relationships. The way that we keep a safe campus is we have an invested campus. The way that we keep safety at the Paramount is talking to children about what makes them feel unsafe. The SROs in some children's lives made them feel unsafe. So how do I make you feel safe? And not only you, but how do I make someone else who did want the SROs there? How do I make you feel safe? It's asking the question, what creates safety and health in your life? and then providing that for the students. It doesn't have to come in the form of policing. It just doesn't. It didn't do it when I was a kid. I didn't have police on campus when I was a child and I felt safe. It was a culture. The school had a climate and a culture that bred safety, that bred investment. Kids cared about each other, so that's why we picked up the trash. We cared about each other, that's why we didn't jaywalk. We cared about our community, that's why we did be part of, that's why we were part of leadership and part of outreach and part of it. You have to up this empathy. We're missing that empathy for one another and this is the time to do it. And the SROs being out of that space creates room for creating our own safety. How do we take care of each other? And I think it's putting more adults on campus, putting trained adults on campus, adults who are trained in trauma, putting more parent volunteers on campus. And specifically in Hercules, we have parents and retirees that should be on campus, get badged. Let's get them that badging process happening. Let's remove barriers to that badging process and let's get our campuses full of our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. I'd like to go to Trisha for her second question, thank you. Okay, this question um, is, what role do you see policy playing within the district? And Camila, the did, you, did you hear that question? I believe Ms. Tricia said, mm -hmm. what role do we see policy 
planning Correct. in the district? Correct. Okay. Do, are you just speaking about general policy? General policy, right. Okay. What role does that play within the district and on the board? So policy guides practice. You have to have policy that's equitable, sustainable, and that builds capacity. So if you're talking about localized policy, site policy, mm -hmm. or if you're talking about district mandated policy, it has to have a good way of implementation, but it also has to have firm stability. It can't be redone every time there's a new cycle of children or every time there's a new cycle of a new cycle of board members. It has to be reevaluated because things change. We are reevaluating policy now because of COVID. And when we reevaluate policies at a macro and a micro level, we need to do it through the lens of equity, sustainability, and building of that capacity and implementation. How is it going to affect those? Every policy impacts people from the top down. We have to make sure that our most vulnerable student population, our SPED students, our African-American students, our students of color, our ELD students, our students who are dual immersion students, we have to make sure that the policy, how it impacts those historically marginalized student populations. And we have to do it with generosity of spirit. What can I do to make sure that you're okay to still get the outcome that I want on this side? That's how I see policy. And I see the board being implemental in that. It, they're instrumental in that, excuse me. Instrumental in that because again, they set the culture. Thank you, Ms. Tricia. Thank, thank you. you so much, Estella. So, so Ms. Tricia, thank you so much for that question. And so I'm, I'm gonna go a little organizational development and you guys on this one, because really the construct of policy is something that is clustered into uh, organizational development, right? So it starts with policy, it's followed by process, it's continued by procedures so you can implement. So when you have policy, it's really directed against and partnered with the value of that organization. Schools are here to educate students. So first and foremost, our policy should be pegged on how are we educating and addressing educational issues for the young people in our community. From there, you would actually create processes. And a process, let's say it's if it's a safety policy, we say we've got a safety policy, this is what it looks like. The board actually defines that, comes up with measurements on what success would look like, comes up with agreements on how we'd actually implement it and come up with processes. So I would say that, let's say the relationship and the partnership and the contracts associated with the different cities around the SRO is part of a solution that is actually at the process level. We said we want safety. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to have SROs. Another safety measure could actually be, okay, do we have crossing guards? Another safety measure should be having a program associated with maybe after school programs or training those individuals. Now we actually go into procedures, which is part of implementation, which is again, what we would see at the local level. So at the local level, it might be having your CSOs be part of that safety, you know, having SROs in security and having SROs actually boots on the ground doing work in order to make sure that our students are getting the benefit of the policy and the goal that we have set. So that's actually how it clusters down in my mind. What I also would wanna make sure is in place though, which I think is probably a, a best practice that we can adopt for our district is to actually have measurements regular measurable reported information that says this is what's happening with that policy you set oh by the way at the local level i decided that the program that is connected to supporting the policy is a b c d e f g and i'm now going to show you that yes we actually have attendance we have all of those different things that we've agreed as as a measure to make sure that we're actually connecting back to that policy so that's how it nestles down and, 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 and I'm gonna stop right there, but that's how I see what this means. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Trisha. Thank you so much. I'd like to go to Anton and back to Estella. Anton. My, my question is in the fiscal area. What is your understanding of the district's current fiscal situation? Wow, okay. So um, we have a big challenge in front of us. As you guys know, 
Um, we already had a $39 million deficit last year. And that is actually something that happened before COVID. Now, um, the last time I saw an official forecast of where we are, as far as deficits, we're at about $54 million. This was something that our CBO um, had shared um, end of May, beginning of June. Of course, the state, because we haven't completed the tax cycle, will have late deferrals which means we probably, we are going to have cash flow problems. And from um, what I'm hearing, that the cash flow problems are probably going to start hitting us, not in the fall, but in the, in the spring, like mostly all over summertime. So there's conversations also happening around how do we actually get out of that. There are things that, that people are talking about, what they call a trend, um, that's basically a note, so that we can actually make sure that we can bridge over those cash flow issues. We're looking at the board on Wednesday was talking about promote, uh, proposing different ways of actually getting revenue. Um, one of the board members was saying, we have empty um, properties that could be rented out as a um, you know, way of actually gaining revenue. So I believe that right now it definitely needs to be all hands on deck because we've got a big issue in front of us. And what it would really require is a lot of the discipline and tightening of belts that we should be doing and should have been doing even before. Thank you for the question, Anton. Thank you so much, Jamila. So back in 2017, the district started spending more than it was bringing in. So, and it kept doing it and it kept doing it. So now, like Estella said, we're topping in this next year is gonna be 50 plus million dollars in the hole. So the way that you get out of a hole is you stop digging, stop, digging yourself in a hole. And that means making some really, really hard decisions that should have already been made. So how do you make hard decisions in your own finances? You prioritize what has to be paid, what has to get done, and how do you protect the most vulnerable? So you keep it away from the teachers and you keep it away from the kids. So how do you have to cut a program and not cut an experience? See, every dollar is attached to a person. In this district, we spent over 90% of the budget on people, on people. So how are we going to make sure and ensure that we are not stripping the district so clean and bared so much to the bone that the children and those in charge of the children, the teachers and the families suffer? So that's gonna take creativity, but most of all, it's gonna take transparency. We have to be able to look at that budget, and I've studied the budget, and for the first time studying it, on the, at the first time studying it, it looked like Greek. What am I looking at? So then I had to go and I had to study some more and study some more and study some more. We need to have the budget in plain speak so parents can look at it and say, okay, I see what's happening. I'm on board. I'm invested. I understand that there's going to be cuts. And because something's getting taken away, how can I step in that gap and fill that position? Because children still need after school programs, even if you can't pay for it. You bring a CBO in there, a community based organization that says, I will provide it. You bring a charity in there and say, I will give it. You reach out to big business and big companies and say, we need your help. You have to get that narrative out there that we don't have any money. No matter what the numbers look like, no matter how you can read a spreadsheet, at the end of it, you see a minus in front of it, you know you don't have any money. You don't have any money, but we still have people we have to serve. So what do you do? You get invested people involved in your struggle. You don't sit in silence. You don't sit in silence. You never be thirsty under a waterfall. We live in California. California has some money. We need to be begging for it. Not asking, begging because we don't have any money, but these kids still have to get educated and they still deserve experience and exposure to put them in the best position to, to transition seamlessly into the next part of their life. And that's gonna take work. It all is gonna take work and it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna be fun, but we can get the job done to set it up for the people who come after us. And that's our job. Thank you, thank you. Jamila. So I'm going to ask the question back to Jamila. Um, tell us your thoughts about the interest-based bargaining that we have amongst our bargaining units, maybe especially in the context of possibly having a new superintendent. So it's, I'm a, I'm a labor person. I understand that when you have investments, we have this 
uh, our district has PLAs. And when you have investment where the community, you pull from the community and the community invests back into the community. So it is transferable. It goes in and it comes out. That's very important to me. It's important to me that there's a high level of accountability, meaning that I always taught where I lived. And I did that so people would be able to find me if they had a question, to be able to understand that I am a local person here. So I have a high degree of investment. That needs to go to our superintendents too. It needs to go to all of our leaders. What is your investment level inside our community? We have a huge community. We have a huge district. And we need to make sure that there's someone in that position of leadership that understands it at a local level, but also understands how policy affects all of us. And that can only happen when that person is willing to go to each sector and invest. So when we start looking for a new superintendent, or if the old super, superintendent is kept, there has to be a recalibration of investment level. You are on the ground. You are the one that takes the voice back out. So what do we need when we are hiring? When we are hiring, we need to look at the hiring panel. Are we represented all in the hiring panel? Do we have people that it hits and impacts every person at that? Do you have a community member on the panel? Do you have a parent on the panel? Do you have someone that, a teacher on the panel? Do you have a union person on the panel? Do you have people in every sector that you're gonna be charge of, in charge of, do you have them in the building so you can express and hear their concerns? So, so when you ask the question, I look at it all in three points. You listen, you learn, you lead. So you have to listen, listening sessions. You have to learn, you have to do the research and the resources and know who to ask. And then you have to lead. So that comes to everything that we do as a board. We need to listen, we need to learn, and we need to lead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamita. Stella. So um, currently, especially because of the tremendous change that our education system is going through, we are all figuring out how to move forward with our collective bargaining. And not just West Contra Costa, it's really happening throughout California. In fact, I believe that we're a little ahead because there are certain school districts that have not gotten to the point where they at least have an MOU with their collective bargaining units. In West Contra Costa, we actually have five. And I know that, again, at the board meeting on Wednesday, there's already actually a drafted MOU that will be covering um, those five bargaining units that I believe right now is going through a vetting process and very quickly, people who are probably part of those groups will be voting on the MOU. Um, from things that I've been hearing from friends and um, partners that I've got all over the district, everybody's really pulling together to make sure that we have our students in the middle, that we still are providing the quality education that our students deserve. So that's actually very heartening to hear. So, so with that in mind, I am very hopeful that very quickly here, probably within the next two weeks, I hope that we would actually be able to have a contract that we can stand on and we can move forward from that. As far as your question about the superintendent, uh, because our current superintendent got a um, review, so in the marginal review, performance review, you guys probably all know this, that means that his contract will not be renegotiated. And what that does for us is that we really need to start looking at um, the hiring process for how we would um, identify that new person. Um, as you guys know, many, um, many of these procedures would really take a long time. So there's actually advocacy, advocacy happening already at the board level about starting it sooner and not waiting until the spring to find somebody and actually you know, get them started. We really need to be slowly identifying this person, making sure that they fit our culture and the challenges of our district because we really are a you know, suburban and urban district. So we need to find that uh, person. And what I'm looking for and what I would be expecting is really a level of alignment as far as the vision and the management and um, management and style of interacting with um, the leadership group. Um, the, the way we've actually done our hiring in the past is basically through like a town hall 
where everybody kind of came together. This is how we actually hired Superintendent Duffy after Dr. Harder left. We had a town hall meeting. Everybody kind of got to weigh in. We shared information that then gets vetted up and to like, you know, to the point that we make recommendations, those different um, um, committee groups. So the DLCAP, the CAC, and, um, you know, the, the, the APAC group and all of those groups actually got on their own and then we rolled up our um, wish list, if you will, so Thank that you. the board got to see that. So Thank that's you. our process. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to uh, Roland again and I'm looking at the clock and um, mm -hmm. based on our time, we have about 10 more minutes because I want to have a chance to uh, have a little uh, summary from our candidates and I want to post up that information again. So uh, we may not finish this round, but uh, we'll go where we can. And again, I'll remind everybody when I post that information, uh, you'll know that both candidates are very interested and willing to answer your questions directly through their communications, even though we may not get to your type of question today. So Roland, and we're going to go back to this. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, as a board member, how would you address systemic racism and promote equality, inclusivity, and diversity? And that's for me, Mayor, is that correct? I thank think you. yeah, you're the next, yes. So, thank so you. this is, so thank you. So this is actually, um, and, and this is how I see systemic inequalities and systemic racism have happening. It's actually really fundamental to how the structure of the organization is. Because it is a public institution, that means the public monies that we've invested in this organization needs to support as many people as possible. That means it needs to cater, if you've got a bell curve, it needs to cater to the 80% of that bell curve. Automatically, if you're looking to actually maximize what you're spending based on that 80%, you've got the sides that are going to be marginalized. That's the, how the system is put together. So when people tell me there's systemic racism and inequalities, it's because of that. I believe that the way you actually make sure that the marginalized population of the organization is getting a lot more visibility and that there's actually a light being shine on their need, shown on their needs is that you actually create the organizations that we already have. Um, APAC is one of them. Health Enrichment has always advocated for, um, for the students in the Richmond area and the African American community. There's actually a phenomenal group that I've become a member of and it's the West Kano Regional Group. And these are basically immigrant families who are training how to navigate and figure out how to navigate the school systems. Honoring the voices of those groups is very, very important and a key way for me to stay connected to what's happening with those marginalized groups. I'm already part of the Community Advisory Committees for Special Education, so I'm connected with that. I know what's happening in that community all the time. What I think we need to make sure is in place is the idea of equity. So every, you know, every solution that we have actually is easier to actually adopt because it, uh, it supports the 80%. It's not going to work for this marginalized community. We really need to be adopting a philosophy of equity and that requires, again, that localized, local level interaction and community level advocacy that I'm advocating for. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Stella. Jamila. So this is uh, a question that's not just dear to my heart. It is my heart. I've been black my whole life and been a woman my whole life. So I understand what inequity looks like. I understand what racism is. I can't, it's very clear. If it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. It walks, it has yellow feathers and it's wading itself to the water. It's a duck. So we don't have to name it anymore. We know what it is. We are dealing in a system that wasn't built for all the people it's supposed to serve. The school system, it doesn't have to be changed. It has to be broken down. It only was built, it works the way it was intended to work. The school system works the way it was intended to work and it's only for a small group of people. White males with money. And majority of the people that we serve are not white males with money or land. 
that's not who this system was that's who the system was intended to work for and that's what it does it works for those people how do we get it to work for everyone else you got to break it all the way down you have to be honest and you have to be transparent and you have to know studies have shown data has shown that if it works for african american and the black population it works for everybody the the pedagogy the teacher the instructional pedagogy if it works for african american and black students it works for everybody the training the relationships if you can build a relationship with an african american student you can build a relationship with everybody so let's attack the original sin the original sin was the marginalization of black students in this education system so let's focus on that and everybody will reap the benefits all tides will rise once you attack that original sin and how do you do it you put the expert in the room you put the expert in the room you put the person that not only understands the marginalized community because they are the marginalized community but you put that person in the room that's able to listen to those other parts of the population who has a special ed understanding because their child is in special ed you put that person who has an understanding of a gate student because they have a gate student you put an understanding of a child who may have that disciplinary issue discipline is not a problem students don't students aren't problems they have problems and we have to get to that understanding students are not problems they have problems so put in the trauma education put in the social emotional education put in the way that you can look at a child and say i'm healed i'm here to heal i take a step towards your healing that's how you tack systemic racism you get clear and honest and you call a thing a thing we are dealing in a racist system so put an expert in the room that can call it and say nope that's a duck Nope, that policy is a barrier. That policy builds inequality. When you have a meeting at a school at nine o'clock in the morning, you are not trying to get parents there. Parents work. Parents of color and black parents work. They need to, they have to. It's a very few of us that have set ourselves in a position where we don't. And it was a struggle to get there. So when I'm at a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm at a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning with the understanding that I gotta take this information back to my sisters and brothers who work. That's how you break down systemic racism. You break down the barriers. Thank you. I could go on and on, but I see my smiley face. So I'm gonna stop on this one. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to go to Dion and then back to Jamila. Thank you, Dion. Thank you. Um, as a trustee for um, this ward or a board member, um, you, re you will represent residents in multiple mun municipalities. How will you work with uh, the communities in your ward um, and their elected representatives to ensure that the diverse educational needs of each community are met? Thank you, Dion. This goes back to relationship building. This goes back to you having my phone number and me having yours. This goes back to me showing up at that table that you reside on and say, okay, how do we work together? What's going on? Let's have a conversation. It is different areas in the same ward, but Hercules and Pinole, we're sister cities. We are sister cities. We may live in Hercules, but we shop in Pinole. We may be here, but we get the benefit over there. It's one of those things that we have to come together and realize what's that zone of mediation? What's that nexus that we can work for to bring this part of the ward, this part of the district to the board? There are five different people that sit on that board. One of them is gonna represent this ward for four years. That's gonna bring a stability to the board and it's gonna bring our voices to the board. So we have to be really clear on getting someone who has that sweat equity, who has done that legwork and understands the way a school works inside and outside, not only as a teacher, but a parent volunteer and as a community leader who knows the names of the community, who understands the community, has more phone, I have more phone numbers of people that aren't my family in my phone because I'm answering, how can I help you? What's going on? Yeah, I got you, I'll go up there. I had a, the, the woman in the high school who is our office manager, she said, I was looking through the emergency cards and your name shows up on more emergency cards for parents than other people. And that's how I have built my life as a community server and not only as a teacher, but as an ally to those parents, as a voice for the teachers, as a community voice. That's why when you do the community walk, when we created the community walk in Hercules because of in wake of 
Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, when we created that, it was a time to bring the community together and know that we have to be a bridge. We have to be a bridge to one another. We have to put that trust back into it and we have to move forward together. So how will I work with Hercules and Pano and our city council? I will work. I will work with them. I will put a cap on this idea that we are separate. We are one. Hercules and Pano were sister cities. City council and the school community, we're together. You can't have a community without students. Hercules has a lot of students in here. We have five schools in one small area. So we have to work together. We are the bridge to each other. We have to be a community and that takes it on every level. So I will work by asking, how can I help you? This is what I need from you. This is what I can do. Wake up early and stay late, Dion. That's what service is about. And I'll do it for Pinole and Hercules. Already done it for Hercules, been doing it for Hercules. We'll continue to do it for Hercules and that part of Richmond. Thank you so much, Stella. So um, because it is going to be a, a uh, basically a negotiation, we do have five um, individuals that are sitting on that uh, on, as, as board members. It is going to be very important, first and foremost, that um, I am grounded on the needs of this community. And I believe I am because I grew up here. So I have a lot of relationships with the folks in Pano. I have friends who have gone to Pano Valley High School. So I know the beat of this community. At the same time, it's important to have relationships with the rest of the district so that the decisions that you're making are in fact for the benefit of the entire district with a strong voice that's coming from district one. So I go back to what I was saying, which is a community school model. And in fact, I've been advocating for it with a number of my partners, if you will, that I've um, created through 10 years of service for our district. And I've been basically vetting this idea about how would it be if we actually adopt a full-blown community school model. Because we actually had it about 2016, but it stopped and it never got fully implemented on the northern side of the district. So that conversation is now happening. And with the community model, we would be able to actually focus on our community needs, yet still be associated with the rest of the structure for the whole district. That's where my idea of global policy with localized implementation comes in. What it does do is it gives a lot of the, um, the, the power, the say so on a much more local level that would require administration, parent, community members, teachers, and student buy-in so that we know what that looks like while we're still very much tethered to the policies and the goals of our district. So we've got that alignment in place. And that is what I would be putting into office as I go into this and what I wanna make sure that you guys also understand. Um, I've actually sent this information about community schools to a lot of folks. I'd really like to know what you think of it because that's what I'm advocating for. That together with working with our existing um, service organizations like the Rotary would be one way where we can create a even more robust, more capacity in the system that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, I'm gonna to go to Tricia. Tricia's question might be the last based on our time, but I will go to Anton and ask him. And my question, my last question has already been covered by uh, great answers from our candidates. So uh, Tricia and yours will go to Estella. Okay, Estella, what do you see as two to three needs that um, are must be priorities in the district? Um, so the must priorities for our district is first and foremost, making sure that we actually continue to provide the quality education that our students need. There are right now, because of the changes that's happening around us, there are um, enrichment issues that I'm hearing about around how we're working with our students and the training that needs to go underneath that after we get that MOU from our bargaining units to make sure that we go back into that quality type of education. Is that going to be asynchronous learning? So there's actually this concept around synchronous and asynchronous learning that is driving how the days of our students will be. Synchronous being, um, 
you know, like this. This is synchronous. It's like it's same time, different place. So that is actually live learning. There's asynchronous, which gives a lot of our students more time on their own, a lot of them driving their own learning. So that kind of a model is a complete change for how we do things. I believe we need to make sure we're on the same page, both teachers and parents and students on how we manage that. And we are actually clear about what we see as success in that new model. That's a change in a very big way that we need to be addressing. The second thing is, you know, once we have our hands around that, and that's a big thing, is that we go back to those marginalized communities that are actually, this model of distance learning is not working for them at all. Uh, during the task force, there was about between eight to 6% of our families that just cannot do this. And I know many of them are in fact in the special ed community. Because a parent reported to me that now she's having to be the teacher, the tutor, she's the, what, what they call a service manager, which means they're gonna kind of like orchestrating specialized services, OT, speech, and all of these different things. And then she's still the parent, and then she still has to do her own work, and then she still has to like manage the household. That is just not something that's going to be sustainable. The good thing is our district is actually working very hard with those families, but that's gonna be really expensive and we cannot stay within that model. So those are two things. The third, the, 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 the third thing that I would say is the social and emotional health of our students. We already know that before COVID, a lot of our students, this particular generation have had a lot of issues with mental health. We already know that. How do I again come up with a way to create that community once again? So the project that I actually have now with the interactors is exactly that. And we're looking to expand it to other cities so that we can actually create a program with the help of service organizations like Lions, Kiwanis, and Rotary to help our students in that, now they, they're talking about a Wellness Friday. Maybe it's that Wellness Friday that we need to go in so we can actually get the community help to let the teachers have more time to do the things that they need to do with this new model. So those three things. So first, how do we actually get our, our, our head around an agreement around this new reality of distance learning? The second thing, very marginalized communities and students who would be struggling. And then the third thing is, how do we make sure we put back community in the lives of our students with the help of our service organizations? Those Thank three you. Things. Thanks Thank for sharing. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much, Jamila. So the three top priorities, Ms. Trisha, is what you're asking about. So the three top priorities right. that I have as a board trustee, one is around the who's in front of our children. So how are we supporting the teachers? How are we supporting the, stu uh, the leaders? How are we supporting the educators? How are we supporting the staff? Because those are the ones that are directly impacting our children at every step of their educational process. So that has to be a priority, not only hiring, not only retaining, but supporting. It has to be a three-pronged approach. You have to hire well, you have to set up a system of retention, which includes coaching and training and the grace to make a mistake and to fail up, and you have to create the supports around that. So the supports around that leads into number two. That's your community. How do you ensure that you have a community based organizations that are inside the school and inside the school so much that they are a culture, they become part of the culture of the school. The Richmond does it well. You have the Richmond Revolution that's inside that school now who just started. This group just started, but they are putting themselves at the table. You have healthy, healthy Richmond. You have the rise. We have good models for Ward 1 through 5. There's good models. We have good modeling in Hercules. You have the Hercules Education Foundation that has been instrumental into the schools, providing money. You have the Rotary. You have the library. You have ways that we have done it well without a title and without a name. But we have put those communities into our schools, and we need to continue to do that. How do you bring the climate team to the table to make sure they are protecting the most marginalized students? Well, one way to protect the most marginalized students is to hear their voice put their voice on the table. If I wanna know what's happening in the special ed classroom, I need to ask. Me, when I did substituting, when I substituted in the special ed classroom during the year, it gives you a real understanding of the different struggles that happen at different levels for our students. We have to be a, 
a school community that's empathetic and understanding and forward moving to solution based. The third thing I will do, the third thing that I will make sure that I concentrate on and understand is we have to worry, we have to put attention to and worry about the sustainability of the policies that we put in place. How are we making sure that we're putting policy that not only fixes a short term decision, and this is talking about budget, one part of it is budget, but a long term fix. We are not going to have money for a very long time, Ms. Tricia, in this district for a very long time. So we need to start getting creative now. We need to start planting the seeds with elementary school parents now and saying we're going to need you for the next 13 years because you have to be the investment in your child's education. So we need to take the barriers down. And those are the things that I'm gonna concentrate on. The teaching, the support of the teachers, the students and the parents, the support of the budget, making it clear that we're not gonna have money and we have to get creative. And those marginalized students, bring them to the table and say, what do you need and how can I serve you? Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, Anton, do you wanna ask your question or uh... Did you have enough information for today? Yeah, I think I'll pass, thank you. Okay, and I'm gonna pass. So, uh, and thank you, but what I wanna do is I want to try to share my screen again. And so, so Estella came up. So uh, I'll start here. There's um, a reminder that Estella is uh, very available in our community and uh, she will ask and answer your questions. Um, that you can send directly any of these ways. And so with that, I'll go to Estella and ask her if she'd like to have a short little uh, sum up and uh, so we can thank you for being here, Estella. Thank you, Steve. So um, I, I feel very blessed to be part of this community. Um, I think we have a unique opportunity to finally have representation uh, for our students and our families in West Contra Costa Unified School District. I want us to be together in this journey. So my promise to you is that I will continuously share information that I'm learning. That is why I have the Estella for Education Facebook group. There is the next door forum for budget accountability. And I, will be, I am sending regular updates as I am growing through this journey. Um, I'm asking you to engage with me. I think this is a way for us to learn together, to better understand each other, and to have common context because we have some big challenges ahead of us. We, this is going to be a very different year. This is going to be something that is completely new to, new to all of us. And we need to be already, have trust with one another. We have 32,000 young people whose education is on the line. One of them is my son. He's actually a senior this year. And I think District 1 needs a representation that can hit the ground running because we need to make well thought out decisive decision. I have the organizational skills. I have the management experience, the leadership capability, and the existing partnerships with the 10 years of my volunteering throughout the district that I know would make sure and can help ensure that we have effective representation from District 1. Thank you very much for listening to me today. God bless and salamat po. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to my share screen and there is uh, Jamila and I want to point out that I'm going to scroll down but I'll come back. So here's her basic information and you can see that she has Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, so she's also very accessible and is interested in hearing from you and will answer questions. And I will go to Jamila. Thank you so very much, everyone. This was a real pleasure. This was an honor to be here and to listen to the questions. And I want to thank Estella for coming and being part of this journey. Um, this is what I know to be true. I was a teacher in Richmond. I was a teacher in Alabama. I was a teacher in Hercules. I've lived here for 10 years. I bring value wherever I go because I bring the understanding of the best teachers are teachable. And I'm teachable. I'm willing to learn. I, I've always listened and I want to lead. And I want to lead in a capacity that affects the greatest 
group in the greatest population in the greatest sense i've been doing this work for as a teacher for over 15 years in the education field in some point as a community involved parent i've been doing that since my child entered kindergarten for 180 days if you had her you had me i was there and finally they got to the point they were like well we gonna have to use her for something because she just keeps sitting by the fence from 8 30 to 3 30 she was just by the fence so i was the crossing guard i helped put kids in the car along with miss anna i worked at lupine i did those things that led me to this point to say i got you don't worry about it i can help you i will be that voice to the board it takes hard it is hard to go in front of a principal or to go in front of a board and say this is what i need i need help it takes a level of vulnerability and we're all not there yet but i am i'm there i have already been ostracized for speaking the whole truth i've already been pushed to the the corners of it but said i'm still coming through the door i have done this work to get to this position to where you can take a deep breath take a minute i got you i will walk this road for you unabashedly and unapologetically honest because i understand what you need i get it i get the marginalized populations enrichment i taught there i live there i get it i understand that hercules has it good and we want it better and that's okay that's a valuable point we do have good bones in hercules and Pinot, but we want better and i can take that to the board too i have a spirit of collaboration and organization and all of that i'm not polished and i'm not a politician but i will get the job done because i've been doing it without a title for years and i will continue to do it having the word trustee behind my name only describes what i've already been i've been a trusted member of this community and a trusted member of the teacher community for years my entire life has brought me to this point to humbly ask you to continue to trust me continue to allow me the privilege of serving you because i know it's an honor these are your babies and i will hold them like they're my own matter of fact i'll hold them better than my own because i can break mine and it'll be okay i will never break yours <laughs> thank you i appreciate thank you. it thank you so much i would like to give my thanks uh first here uh dion thank you for uh rescuing me and i apologize for the beginning a little rough I, i've never done this before but i'm learning as well I guess I should have done a webinar and uh, maybe next time. I'll, I'll remind everybody that at 12 o'clock, uh, you can go to the city council forum. I'm afraid it's gonna probably look better than mine and I'll be embarrassed. But anyway, so I wanna go around uh, to Roland, Dion, uh, Tricia for your opportunity for thanks. So Roland. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, um, Jamila and Stella, for being with us today. And um, I think you really did a great job today. And also to my fellow um, panelists, um, Council Member Dia Bailey and Tricia and Anton and of course Steve Kirby. And I really um, actually learned a lot today from 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 you know from from this um, discussion from the from this Q and A. And I um, would like to you know uh, wish you the best. And uh, good luck to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roland. Dion. Yes, thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, thank you uh, to Mayor Scubias and then to uh, the other members here from the community who I learned a lot from in the past week. That's Trisha and Anton. And then also thank you to our candidates, Jimmy LaFold and Estella uh, DePaz. Um, we wish you the best of luck as well. And I mm -hmm. uh, hope to see one on the city council forum coming up shortly after this meeting. And, and thank you again. Thank you. Tricia, we've lost your video, but are you there? I'm here. I'm yeah. not sure how we lost the video. It's beyond okay. me. But Go ahead I'd and like, give your thanks. Okay. I'd like to thank the Hercules Democratic Club for putting this together. I think it's been very valuable. Um, and I'd like to thank, of course, my, my uh, committee members, and especially to Estella and Jamila, uh, for putting up with us and listening to our questions. It's been very, um, very enlightening. There I am. And I really appreciate that you've taken the time today and tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you. And Anton. Yes, I'd also like to thank the uh, candidates. And I want everybody to know that we're making history here today. This election will result in the first candidate 
from Hercules being on the West Contra Costa Unified School District Board of Education and its history. Thank you so much. Uh, to let everybody know, this committee is meeting tomorrow, I believe 10 o'clock with Estella. We'll talk with her uh, one with one for an hour. Then we're going to meet with uh, Jamila at 11. And uh, I think at 12, we are going to meet with uh, Contra Costa College School Board member. And then this will uh, culminate in uh, an, ador an endorsement, suggestion, recommendation that will go to the the whole members of the whole and that will be announced and done on the 14th Friday seven o'clock so uh, with that I'll ask if there's any final comments from any of the committee members or anybody else otherwise I want to thank people we had uh, over 40 uh, participants there uh, we can see your names and uh, we know you're uh, very well involved in everything and I want to thank you and uh, in a moment, I'll be signing off. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you, Estella. I'll do this one last. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank Dion. You. <laughs> Before everybody leaves the call, if I can just say that if you don't have the link for the city council, if you go to the uh, Facebook page for Hercules uh, Democratic Club, I'll also read it out loud here, if it's okay with you, Steve. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll do it twice because we know it's a lot of numbers. So anyone who does not have that webinar code, it's 861-3134-7888. And I'll do that again. The number is 861-3134-7888. And that starts at uh, noon today. Thank you. Will they need a password? Uh, should I need a password to log in? Should should not is what I'll say. Should is the keyword there. Yeah, I don't know. Do, will they need it? I'm saying should not. If they have an issue, go to the Facebook page. That just allows folks to get there without the Perfect. Facebook page. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And Steve, last note: just don't forget to stop recording. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Done.